do. <laughs> um, uh, um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Emma. Emma's been in the group for quite a while now. Um, <laughs> the, and I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna be really sad to see her go. I mean, it's uh, um, Emma's always been sort of like someone I could completely count on to, you know, when it came to things going on in the lab or or dealing with issues with whatever it was. You know, I could I could go to Emma and say, I got this problem and, and, and she could deal with it. And um, and I think she's been sort of the go to person in the group on a lot of different things. Um, from you know, not just the, the instrumentation and, and the microscope, but also um, how the software works and, and, and how to do a lot of the analysis and, and so on and um, has really I think been there for and, um, the other members of the group and sort of getting them trained and, 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 and getting them sort of in the lab and going and so on and I think in that respect she's it's been it's been awesome and, and thank you for that um, the uh, Emma's Done some really nice work. She started out. Um, uh, I had a, a, a postdoc who, um, well, and a postdoc and graduate student who, like, done some work on silicon nanowires early on, and it sort of measured sort of surface recombination properties in these nanowires. And there was always this sort of there was at the time there was this question: Is it like, um, is is it a property of, of the surfaces in the individual wires, or is it like some sort of average? Um, kind of property. I, I almost positive I was going to talk about this. I don't really want to get into it too much. <laughs> but um, what it required to answer that question was to go in and basically do the same type of experiment on um, many, many, many different nanowires. And um, and so I like sort of bring this up one day, and Emma says, "Oh, I could do that." And I think that was probably like you know <laughs> three hundred nanowires later. Um, yeah. uh, she had she had this, this this data figure, which I think was quite remarkable. Um, but it wasn't just that; it was like anything that I came into lab. Said, oh, "Let's try this. Let's try that." And if I can do that, I can do that. And um, that's that's been a lot of fun to sort of be able to sort of collaborate with them over the years. Um, so I'm going to kind of stop there and let Emma tell us about what she's been doing. Um, and thank you all. All right. Thank you all so much for being here. Um, especially given the somewhat chaotic circumstances uh, around today. Um, I know some of you have to leave early, so I'm gonna try to speed through some of the things um, that are similar to what Erica said. Uh, essentially, the work that we do in our group is we look at the behavior of electrons in silicon nanowires. Well, in semiconductor nanostructures in general. I look at silicon nanowires. Um, and we do this using a technique called pump probe microscopy. And so, uh, first I'd like to tell you a little bit about what it is, what we can use it to learn, um, and then some of my results. Um, I was going to walk you through everything I've done over the last seven years, um, but instead of, of all of it, I'm just going to give you the, the highlights really quickly. So, I've been really interested in instrument development. Um, all the microscopes that we use in our group are home-built, so, so we make all of them ourselves. Um, and I've been able to, to work on three of them. Um, the first one that I built was a, a transient absorption microscope. And this was similar to one we already had in the group. So this was kind of how I got my feet wet. Um, I then built a low temperature photoluminescence microscope. And that's a, a standard sort of photoluminescence laser microscope, but we incorporate a cryostat, which is basically just a really powerful refrigerator that lets us bring our samples down to about eight degrees above absolute zero. After that, I built a low temperature transient reflectivity microscope. And this is sort of the main uh, project of my PhD. Um, and today I'm, I'm going to present at the end some results that I just got um, from this system um, and explain sort of how it's useful and, and why. Um, so I've worked on a lot of papers while I've been here. The two that I'm going to talk about today uh, the first is, as John mentioned, we were looking at heterogeneity in, uh, in nanowires, and I, I looked at 
something like 300 of these structures. Um, and I'll tell you a bit about that project. And then again, I'll, I'll end with talking about these low temperature uh, studies that I've done. So why do we need to look at things that are sort of ultra fast? Well, there are three sort of main processes that we're interested in in semiconductors. Um, we're interested in something called charge carrier recombination. When I say charge carriers, I mean electrons and holes, um, specifically excited electrons and holes. We're interested in charge carrier diffusion, which is to say how they move along the wire. And we're interested in thermal diffusion, or how heat moves along the wire. And the challenge with these processes is that they're really, really fast, right? To give you an idea how fast, um, it takes you about 400 thousandths of a second for you to blink your eye. 50 times faster than that, eight microseconds is how long, uh, sorry, eight milliseconds is how long it takes for a, a camera shutter to open and close. 1,000 times faster than that is how long it takes an airplane propeller to make one rotation. And 8,000 times faster than that is how long it takes light to travel one foot. We're interested, and that's at one nanosecond. We're interested in things that happen between about 100 nanoseconds down to a few hundred femtoseconds. And there aren't detectors that can really detect things that quickly. So we need to use a trick. And we borrow this trick from photography. So uh, you've probably seen uh, experiments like this in the past. This is an example of strobe photography. So what's happening here is you have a, a set of valves which are releasing droplets of water, and you've got a strobe light. And the strobe light is timed so that it will go off some very precise time after the water droplet is released. And because of this, your eye only sees what, uh, what is illuminated. So your eye only sees what's happening when the flash bulb is on. And if you're careful with the timing, you can time it so that the flash bulb always goes off when the droplet has reached the same distance from the valve. And so you kind of are, are freezing this moment in time. And what's important to note about this is that um, this only works if your flash is much faster than the process that you're interested in. Right? So if your flash stayed on for three seconds, these wouldn't look like droplets. These would look like just a stream of water. But because we're flashing really quickly, we can sort of uh, uh, see this sort of instantaneous uh, uh, droplets. So we do something very similar, except, again, we're looking at things that happen in hundreds of femtoseconds. So we use, instead of a flash bulb, we use laser pulses. Um, specifically, we use two. The first is 425 nanometers, or blue light, um, and it excites a bunch of carriers in our nanostructure, electrons and holes. And that's sort of the equivalent in our analogy of releasing the droplet of water. We then use a second pulse, which is red light, or 850 nanometers, and that acts kind of like our flash bulb. In silicon, the signal that we get um, when you excite carriers in silicon, the silicon becomes more transparent to that second flash pulse, or our probe. Um, so if the probe arrives before the pump, right? The probe arrives before the pump, there aren't many carriers, there aren't any photo-excited carriers in the silicon. A lot of the probe light is going to be absorbed. Very little will get to your detector. And here we can plot the signal that we see at our detector against the amount of time between when the probe and the pump arrive. And I'm going to define uh, the probe arriving before the pump as being negative time. And if it arrives after, it's positive time. If they arrive simultaneously, the pump excites a bunch of electrons and holes. The nanowire becomes transparent. We get a lot of probe light at our detector. If we wait a little while, so we pump it and then we wait and then we probe, some of those carriers have time to recombine the wire is less transparent, we get less light at the detector, and so on. And so we can use this curve to sort of uh, uh, quantify how quickly those carriers are recombining and get something called a light time. So how does that recombination happen? Well, silicon is an indirect band gap semiconductor, which means the electrons in the holes can't just recombine 
with one another uh, across the band gap. Instead, they have to go through some intermediate, uh, what we call trap state or recombination center. And these are usually defects like uh, dangling bonds or atoms that you know are not silicon, so dopants or, or surface, um, oxygen or hydrogen or gold atoms. And in a silicon nanowire, this happens predominantly at the surface, right? So the wires that we have are really high quality, which means that the silicon in the bulk of the wire is very, very pure. But the surface is exposed to oxygen, it has a lot of dangling bonds, and so that's where you get a lot of these, um, these defects. Now, for people who are making devices out of silicon nanowires, solar cells, transistors, um, sensors, anything like that, the quality of the surface is really important. And so it's really useful to, to be able to quantify that and say this wire has a quality that it, you know, is described by some number. Turns out that number is S, which stands for the surface recombination velocity. And that's proportional to how many defects there are or how many of these recombination centers there are at the surface. So more defects means larger value for S. What this means is that if that value of S is large, the lifetime is going to be small. Recombination is going to happen quickly. So you can relate tau, which is the lifetime, to one over that term S. Because these are all at the surface, uh, sorry, I don't know. It's just disconnected. Yes, I know. Sorry about that. Because these are all at the surface, um, there's something else that sort of uh, impacts the lifetime, and that's the diameter of the wire. So we're exciting carriers sort of all throughout the wire, but they have to make it to the surface before they can recombine. So if the diameter is larger, they have to travel farther, and it takes them a longer time to recombine than if the diameter is small. So this means that the lifetime is proportional to the diameter. And what this tells us, this expression, is there's a relationship between diameter, lifetime, and S. And if we have, if we measure the lifetime and we measure the diameter, it means we can calculate S. So now we have a way where we can sort of measure how good the surface of a nanowire is. Um, so one way that you might think of to do this, and, and the first way that we did try to do this, was by looking at many wires all at once. Right? So here is, um, if you have a, a typical sort of pump probe experiment that's not in a microscopy mode, you might focus your spot size down to about 200 microns. And at this resolution, you're covering thousands of nanowires at once. And they all look like they are kind of the same, right? So maybe this makes sense. Maybe all the wires that are grown at the same time have the same quality surface. And you can, you can do that. You can just get one lifetime. But as you zoom in, what you notice is that not all the wires are the same. Some of them are thicker or thinner. Some of them have, have bends or, or kinks. Some have the gold catalyst still attached. Some aren't even really wires at all. And so um, you might ask, well, does the behavior of uh, of recombination in one wire, is it going to be the same as that in another? You could even ask, is the behavior in one part of a wire the same as behavior somewhere else? So if I were to look close to the catalyst, am I going to see the same behavior as I, I look uh, at the other end of the wire? And to do this, we're going to use microscopy. So briefly, the way that our microscope is set up, we have a, a mode-locked titanium sapphire laser. We split it into two beams. It's a, it outputs an 850 nanometer pulse. We reduce the repetition rate using acousto-optic modulators. And then the beam that's going to become our pump is frequency doubled to 425 nanometers. The beam that is our probe travels down an optical delay line. And that's just a, a mirror on a translation stage which lets us change how far the probe has to travel before it reaches our sample. And that lets us change how long it takes for the probe to reach our sample. Both the pump and the probe then go through a microscope objective, get focused onto a sample, 
And then our probe light is collected and measured by a balanced photodiode and a locking amplifier. So how can we actually use this to get a lifetime? Well, if we were looking at just transient uh, absorption spectroscopy, so not in a microscopy mode, it's actually really straightforward. Um, your beam covers the entirety of, of, again, thousands of nanowires, and so your entire signal decay just comes from recombination. You can fit it to a single exponential, and you're done. Easy. With microscopy mode, it's a little bit more tricky, though, because now, not only do you have a signal decay due to recombination of the carriers, but also to diffusion of the carriers outside the probe spot. What I mean is our pump excites a number of carriers in a very localized region of the wire. We probe it, and the carriers recombine with one another, but they also travel outside of the probe spot, right? So our lifetimes always look faster than they actually are. So in order to fit this and get an accurate lifetime, we need to know how quickly the carriers are diffusing. Um, and so we do this using something called spatially separated pump probe microscopy, where we pump our carriers in one location and we probe in another. And we do this by changing the angle that the beam goes into the objective. If you change the angle of entry of the beam, you change where on the sample it focuses. So, like Erica showed, we can pump in one location, raster scan the probe across the sample, and generate a map of where carriers are at a given point in time. If we do this for several time points, we create a movie of carriers traveling along the wire. We can then fit those, we can take the stills from that movie, add up the signal in each of the columns, plot that intensity versus the X position, and we get these nice Gaussian-shaped curves, which we can then fit. The diffusion coefficient then comes from how quickly the full width half max of those curves changes with time. Once we have the diffusion coefficient, then we can actually go through and uh, fit these transients and get a lifetime for the recombination. So we use this expression, which looks a little bit daunting, um, but effectively, it's really just three terms. We've got a term here, which is our lifetime, or how quickly the carriers recombine. We have a term here, which describes the diffusion of carriers. And then we have this offset, which is, uh, describes this, this negative going signal, which I haven't mentioned. It's because we're heating up the wire. It's a thermal signal, um, and uh, it, it lasts long enough relative to the the uh, recombination that we can treat it as a, um, a constant offset, and it doesn't really change the lifetimes that we calculate. Okay, so getting back to the silicon nanowires. I mentioned that we wanted to look at surface recombination, right, and, and find out the surface quality of the wires. And when we initially did this, we assumed, okay, if the wires are grown together, they probably have the same surface recombination rate. They probably have the same surface quality. Um, but I wanted to confirm this. So we have this really neat, uh, neat ability to um, take a wire in our microscope and find that same wire in a scanning electron microscope or in an optical microscope or anywhere else because we have a, a registry patterns that we use. So here's an example of this. This is a nanowire. Um, uh, an SEM of a nanowire. This location here is exactly where I took this transient from, right? So we can take the wire to the SEM, measure the diameter. We can take a transient and measure the lifetime, plug it into this expression, and get a value for the surface recombination velocity. Um, so again, I wanted to see if wires grown at the same time would have the same value. So I did this again on a wire from the same growth batch, and again, and again, and 300 more times. And uh, there's a lot going on in this plot, so I'm going to break it down. But the first thing that I want you to notice is the scatter that we see. So if all the surface recombination, all the surface qualities, I'm sorry, were the same, you would expect this to be a fairly flat line, right? But instead, we see two orders of magnitude of variation between the slowest and the fastest surface recombinations. 
You might notice there are a bunch of different colors on the graph. Um, this is because all the wires that I looked at were grown under identical conditions, but they were grown in eight separate batches. So each batch is a different color. Um, but what you can see is that the, the scatter in any batch really uh, mimics the scatter in the population as a whole. So this sort of um, confirms that it's, it's reasonable for us to combine it all into one data set. The second thing I want to point out is it looks like the scatter is, is larger at, in smaller wires. Um, and so I, I histogrammed these. Um, so you can see that the, the distribution of surface, um, surface qualities is a lot larger in wires that are under about 40 nanometers than it is in wires that are, say, above about 70 nanometers. Right? So this means that smaller wires are, have surfaces which are less consistent than the larger wires. The third thing that I'd like to point out is this, this trend that we see in the lowest measured surface recombination velocities. So again, a good surface has very few defects, which means it should have a very small surface recombination velocity. So the smallest one we measure represents the best quality surface that we found. And you can see that after about 40 nanometers, as, you, as your wire gets smaller, the um, the, the best surface that we see tends to get worse, right? The recombination gets faster. Um, so this means that your wires, if you, if you want a really high quality surface, you probably want a wire that's a little bit on the larger side. So all of that was looking at one point on each wire, right? Maybe though the scatter that we saw isn't between wires. Maybe the scatter is because there is that much variation along a single wire, right? And why might that be? Well, these wires are grown um, through CVD or chemical vapor deposition. And the way it works is you have a, a gold catalyst and you heat it up very hot, it becomes molten, and then you flow silane gas through the furnace. The silane dissolves in the gold and you get a, a um, silicon nanowire sort of crystallizes out. Right? So it grows up like this, like a tree. And what can happen is as, as it's growing, some of the gold from the catalyst can be deposited on the nanowire surface. Right? So you might, be, you might think, well, maybe more gold gets deposited, say, early on, when the growth isn't as stable yet. Right? Gold is a really good recombination center, um, so you would have a faster recombination in a region that has more gold, for example. So to uh, look into this, I'm going to introduce you to a, a one more mode of operation of our microscope, which is called spatially overlapped pump probe. And in this configuration, the pump and the probe are focused to the exact same spot, and we can raster scan the sample underneath, right? And go pixel by pixel and create an image of our, of our wire. So I've done that here for a silicon nanowire. Um, at a very, uh, sorry, at, at several different pump probe delays. And it looks like the, the signal decay is pretty much consistent across the entire length of the wire. It might be a little bit faster at this end, but for the most part, it's, it's pretty constant. To confirm this, I took transients at each of five locations along this wire, and they're here. And you can see that the first four so from here to here, do overlay very nicely. The last one is a little bit faster, right? But still, this difference is not nearly enough to give us two orders of magnitude variation in the surface recombination velocity that we saw. But again, that's still just one wire. So um, I looked at a few more. Um, and we were working under the assumption that the region of the wire that's closest to the catalyst is probably going to have the best surface. It's the part that was grown last, um, and so it, it's going to be the most pristine. So the first thing I did was I found uh, 23 nanowires where I could see the gold catalyst in the SEM, and I looked at, um, I looked at the surface recombination within 10 microns of that catalyst. 
And that's what's plotted here in red. And you can see that while maybe the scatter is a little bit less than the scatter of the population as a whole, it's still similar, right? So this suggests that, okay, there is still a lot of, of variation that we see from one wire to another. Uh, the other thing I did is I took 40 nanowires where we couldn't necessarily see the gold catalyst, and I just measured transients at various locations along their length, right? And here are 14 of them, which are sort of representative. Uh, each wire is indicated by a different color. I know it's a little bit hard to distinguish them. But um, what we see is that there is some scatter within a single wire, but it's much less than the scatter of the population as a whole. In fact, the population of a whole, um, sorry, the population as a whole varies by about a factor of 200 from the slowest to the fastest. And in any given wire, that value is about 10 or less, right? So what this means, which is kind of interesting, is that two nanowires can be grown right next to each other and have completely different surfaces. But once they start growing, the surface quality is more or less fixed. It doesn't change as the wire grows. OK, so I'm going to switch uh, tax a little bit now and tell you about this low temperature uh, work that I've done. So I've spent the last few years building this uh, low temperature microscope. Um, here's a, a picture of it. This is our, our cryostat. Um, and why is that something that we even thought would be useful? <laughs> what is the point of low temperature? Well, um, at room temperature, so let's start with silicon. So in, uh, in semiconductors, you've got a lot of sort of shallow energy um, states, which you can, can populate. Um, here, we're going to call them traps again. Um, and at room temperature, KT is about 26 milli electron volts. KT is the amount of energy that your particle just sort of has from its surroundings, right? From its temperature. What this means is that if you have a shallow energy minima, which is less than 26 K, I'm sorry, 26 milli electron volts from the edge of the band, you have enough thermal energy to pop that carrier back into the band. And so you won't see these states. They become thermally inactive, right? As you cool down your sample, KT gets smaller, and you activate more and more of these states. So you can see more of these transitions. Um, a lot of low temperature studies are done with photoluminescence. So this, for example, is one done on, on zinc oxide. And you can see that at 75 Kelvin, you have this sort of broad feature here. But as you cool it down, the peaks begin to resolve themselves. right? So you get more information about these, um, these low energy states when you're, uh, when you're uh, at colder temperatures. And we've also seen um, that the spatial heterogeneity can increase or change at low temperatures. So this is two photoluminescence images of a cadmium sulfide nanowire, um, which I took uh, on our low temperature photoluminescence microscope. This one is at room temperature. This one is at 8 degrees Kelvin. And you can see that the heterogeneity is, is very different. The signal looks very different at 8 Kelvin than 293. Um, so this is the example of our, our uh, low temperature pump probe microscope. The pump probe part is very similar to the one that I showed you before, but now we have a cryostat in it. The sample is housed in here. There's a quartz window that we focus the light through. And because the cryostat is um, very heavy, we can't move the sample under the beam the way we usually do. So instead, we have to move the beam over the sample. To do this, we mount the objective on an XY stage so we can actually move the, the beam and hold the sample still. Another difference is that we have to do these measurements in reflective mode instead of transmission mode. Um, so instead of collecting light down here, the light actually goes back, sort of travels back on itself, hits a beam splitter, and then goes to our detector. All right, so 
the first thing that I wanted to look at at low temperature was diffusion. Um, these are two nanowires, A and B, and I measured the diffusion in both of them. In nanowire B, I measured it at 300 Kelvin, nanowire A at 8 Kelvin. And the 300 Kelvin, you can see that within 67 picoseconds, the, the spot has grown a little bit, right? The carriers have diffused a bit. It's bigger. But at 8 Kelvin, it's almost twice the size, right? So it looks qualitatively like it's diffusing much more quickly. Um, and we can quantify this the same way that we did before. We add up the pixels, we plot it signal against distance, and then we measure the full width half max. And if we plot the full width half max versus delay, you can see that it's much steeper at 8 Kelvin than at 300. In fact, when we measure these, at 300 Kelvin, we get a value of 6 centimeters squared per second. Now, that's on the low end of what we typically see in silicon. Typically, in silicon, we see between 4 and maybe 16, with 10 being sort of common. At 8 Kelvin, we get a value of 22 centimeters squared per second. And that's the fastest that we've ever measured in silicon. Right? That's faster than what it is in bulk at room temperature. Um, so that's really interesting. Why might that be? Well, when you're, uh, when you're at room temperature, the atoms in your, in your nanowire are vibrating, right? And these vibrations are called phonons. And phonons can scatter electrons. So you have your electron that's you know, moving around. It ends up traveling fairly slowly because it keeps hitting a phonon and then having to backtrack, and then hitting another phonon and then having to backtrack. Right? As you cool your system down, you're going to have fewer and fewer vibrations, fewer and fewer phonons. And when you get to, um, to a limit where there's nothing for the, the electron to really scatter against, you get something called ballistic transport. And that's when the carrier moves very quickly, sort of straight in one direction. Right? As you cool it down further, though, you can get another um, process happening, which is trapping and detrapping. So now the carrier can make it to uh, uh, a place where it would scatter. It can get trapped, vibrate, and then you have to wait for it to detrap before it can continue um, on, its, on its way. And so diffusion then slows down again. So you kind of get this curve where as you cool, the diffusion gets faster, 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 and then slower down. All right, so the next thing that I looked at was the temperature-dependent lifetime. So this is nanowire A. Um, and I took lifetimes or, or transients at this location um, at 8 Kelvin, 30, 45, 60, and 298 Kelvin. And what I found is that at room temperature, the lifetime is a lot longer than at low temperature. And for chemists, this is really, really weird. Because this means that we have a process that's happening more slowly when it's hot. And in every single reaction, right, reactions happen faster when they're hot, not slower. Um, so this is a bit strange. Why might this be? Well, this expression um, governs trap-based recombination, which is what we have in, in silicon. One over the lifetime, which is the rate, is equal to nt, which is the number of traps, times the speed, the thermal speed of the carriers, so how quickly they're moving, times this value sigma, which is effectively the size of the traps, right? So the first thing that happens at low temperature is your traps can actually get larger. What's called the carrier capture cross-section is bigger at low temperature. So you increase this value of sigma, that makes T decrease, right? So you have faster process. The other thing that can happen is what I mentioned earlier, which is you lower KT and you thermally activate a bunch of these shallow states that you didn't have access to before. So that increases the value of NT, right? So again, NT, the number of traps increases, means the lifetime decreases. The third thing that can happen has to do with excitons. Um, excitons are, are when you have a, an electron and a hole which are coulombically bound together. Um, and 
In silicon, the binding energy of an exciton is about 15 millielectron volts. So at room temperature, when KT is 26, there's plenty of energy to rip the electron and the hole apart, and an exciton is not stable. But after you get down below about 170 Kelvin, now excitons do become stable, and you can get a new process which is called exciton-exciton recombination. And it's been found in silicon that that can be quite fast, on the order of, of picoseconds. So it could be that in addition to having an increased um, uh, capture cross-section, an increased number of accessible traps, you also have a new process which is contributing to that faster lifetime. All right, the last thing I want to show you is temperature-dependent heterogeneity. So these are spatially overlapped pump probe images of nanowire A at a series of delays at 300 and at 60 Kelvin. And what I'd like to point out is that at 300 Kelvin, room temperature, the top portion of the wire lasts longer than the bottom. So the signal lasts longer up here than it does down here. But interestingly, at 60 Kelvin, it's the exact opposite. The signal lasts longer at the bottom of the wire than it does at the top. So why might that be? Um, it might have something to do with the types of traps. So again, if we look at this expression, up until now I've been talking about NT as the total number of traps. But if we think about it for a second as the number of traps at a specific energy, right? So say deep traps or those that are in the center of the, uh, the band. These deep traps are thermally accessible at 8 Kelvin or 60 Kelvin and at 300. So the number of deep traps doesn't change as you cool your system down. But the number of shallow traps, so yes, yeah, so the number of deep traps is constant. The number of shallow traps, though, does change as you cool your system down. So what this means is if you have a region of the wire which has more shallow traps, then you can see that it will, uh, it will change its lifetime more than a region that has deep traps. Right? So what this could be telling us is that there are more deep traps in the bottom of the wire and more shallow traps at the top. And in these silicon nanowires, uh, gold, for example, acts as a deep trap. A lot of the um, uh, defects that you see at the surface tend to act as shallow traps. So it's possible that this portion of the wire has, for example, more uh, gold defects in it. Um, and that's something I think it would be really interesting to sort of pursue further and see if we could use this technique to get a better idea of what kinds of traps we see in the, in the particular wires. So with that, I'd like to conclude. Um, I have really enjoyed working on, on all of these projects. Um, it's, it's been a really uh, a great experience. Um, and I'd like to thank everybody involved uh, for all of your, your help and your input. Um, Obviously, Professor Papanicholas, this has been great, and I'm, I'm really grateful that you uh, let me join your group <laughs> and that you gave me all these opportunities that you have. It's, it's been wonderful, and um, learning from you and, and being mentored by you has really been an honor. Um, I'd like to thank Professors Eric Grumstrup, David Ziegler, Michelle Gabriel, um, Ralph House, Lindsay Williams, Justin Kirsch Brown, they all sort of helped uh, get me on my feet, taught me the ropes, um, introduced me to the experiments, and generally were just fantastic uh, role models. I'd like to thank now Dr. Erica Van Gotham and Jason um, for all of your help building things and debugging things and sitting with me while I'm, you know, beating my head against a wall with data, et cetera. It's, it's really, you've been fantastic. And I would not have accomplished as much without, without all of your, uh, your help. Um, Leia, you've also been awesome. Um, just being able to, to, you know, 
it, it's been wonderful sort of teaching you a little bit about the microscopes, but then also you've, you've taught me a lot as well, not only about your work, but about the department, about how to be <laughs> in this environment. Um, I'd like to thank the Cahoon group. They've grown all of these wires. Everything that I've looked at was because of, of Jim and his group, um, which has been amazing especially because I hate making things. So this is like the perfect <laughs> partnership. Um, and then uh, Channel and the electronics shop, I would not have been able to do this without those guys. They're amazing. And then of course my friends and family. Um, Y'all have been so supportive and so wonderful. And it really means a lot to me that you came here from you know, the various corners of the world that you traveled from, um, and my wonderful husband. Because, yeah, grad school is really hard, and you've been great. <laughs> so, thank you all very much, and please go and vote tomorrow. <laughs>